I think a couple of days back, I suggested that anyone who wanted to have a few questions answered should step up. So here are some of the questions that came in. Copland, is it in or out of your comfort zone? Well, physically, it was definitely out of my comfort zone, but that's what the character was all about. It's hard of hearing. He had given up on himself, so he exactly wouldn't be a specimen. So that was good. But what was in my comfort zone, I liked doing ensemble work. Rocky was an ensemble piece with all these really wonderful characters. So it was good. It was a good experience. <laughs> but definitely tough to get that weight off. Anyway... What was it like working with Michael Rooker and Cliffhanger and Guardians 2? This guy's fantastic. Just committed to the part, fearless, has an incredible soul, very witty and brave. He was doing things on Cliffhanger between takes of just sliding back and forth over a canyon. This is on his own for fun. In between takes, 4,000 feet straight down with just a simple cable like he was on in the film itself. So Michael is crazy great. Um, <laughs> how did the three seashells work in Demolition Man? Well, without getting too gross, imagine how chopsticks work and use your imagination from there. Okay, who has been your favorite leading lady? Hmm, this doesn't require much thought. Talia Shire. Without Talia, I think Rocky certainly would not have been as successful. I've always said, without Adrian, there is no Rocky. Without that component of the film, it's just two guys punching their face in. And we've seen that actually, historical, historically, boxing films have performed atrociously at the box office because most women did not want to see it. And there was never a story that was compelling enough. It was always about the mafia or this guy taking a dive or so on and so forth. And it just didn't work. So I thought, all right, this is not about boxing. This is the love story. He just happens to be a lackluster, unappreciated, down on his luck, insecure guy who was a fighter. But mainly he was looking for love. And along the way, he found his soul again. So without Talia Shire, I would have been punched out a long time ago. Huh. Did you write all of the Rockies? Every word, every period, every comma, everyone. Also, when I agreed to do Creed 1 and 2, after I saw the original screenplays, which are okay, but they didn't quite capture the Rocky tempo. So every scene I was in, in those films, I wrote too. So it would be very comfortable for me to perform in. Um, which film do you think you were in your worst shape? And, well, that goes Copland. And believe it or not, I thought I was in really terrible shape with Rhinestone because I was way too thin. I had to get thin for certain reasons, and I think I overdid it. Same thing with the grudge match. I got too thin because uh, I was much heavier than Robert De Niro. So I had to come down and wait to make it look plausible. And that was uncomfortable. Um, let's see. And your best shape, best shape you know, was Cliffhanger and Rambo 3, without a doubt. And Rocky 4, that, that's it. So that, they were almost jammed together, but those by far were my primo years. Um, what movie would you like to have redone? Hmm. Stop or my mom will shoot. Let me tell you why. 
the concept you saw was not the concept that was uh, considered. It was, the concept was more of a really hateful mother, like throw mama from the train. She was terrible, she was horrible. The audience was supposed to dislike her. Then she comes out and lives with me and that creates all this tension. But even though I respect her, she's my mother, she's a really a pain in the ass. So instead of doing that, they hire the most wonderful woman to play the part, Estelle Getty. She's like America's sweetheart. She's on the Golden Girls. She's the mother that everyone said, God, I wish you could have raised me. So, so it, it took all that tension away. And I should have done the movie anyway. The only reason I did it is I caught, I, let me try that again. The only reason I did the movie is because I thought Arnold was going to do it. And I was going to fake him out. He faked me out. He started the rumor that he wanted to do it, so I would do it, and oh God, it was a nightmare that he does not have to live with, but I do. Anyway, um, what is the best memory of filming? Wow. It comes in spurts, but overall I would say Rocky Balboa was an incredible pleasure. One, because nobody wanted to do it. I was playing 59, 60-year-old fighter. Everyone thought it was a joke. Luckily, to a guy named Joe Roth, the producer out here, very famous, said, eh, let's give it a shot. And he really went on to do his own thing. So I was kind of like left on my own. There was really no producer. The uh, Irwin Winkler, those guys never showed up at all. So I worked with a fellow named Kevin, and we put together a really good film that no one thought would work. And I feel... It had a lot of heart, and Rocky One and Rocky Balboa, the sixth one, are by far my favorite. So, there you go. Um, let's see. Also, Rambo 4, that's another film. It was 20 years between the making of those films, between Rambo 3 and Rambo 4. It was 21 years, and Rambo 3 didn't work. It just didn't work. Politically, things were changing. The story just didn't jive with the politics at that time. At that time, uh, when I started the movie, the Cold War with Russia was still flagrantly on. In the middle of the movie, Gorbachev comes over, kisses Nancy Reagan on the cheek, and all of a sudden, America and Russia are friends, and I'm looking like the troublemaker. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. So that was that. And uh, Rambo 4 was again, a film that nobody wanted to see, no studio wanted to produce. And it just turned out to me, great. It to, by, by far is my most authentic action film where I said, you know, if this is my last gig, I want it to be the way I want it, and I want violence to be depicted as horrible as it really is. What insurgent or civil war is really about. There's nothing romantic about it. It's grotesque, violent, and detestable. And that's the way it was done. Man, I'm proud of it. <laughs> okay. Um, Oh, profound. Okay, this one may take a little thought. Why did you make it when 99% of actors fail to make a real living in the business? Whew. Well, it's solely not based on just pure talent. It's maybe a talent that's away from the business, meaning your mindset. If you took that mindset and applied it to most professions that you feel that you're really, you know, uh, capable of doing well, if, like driving, and you can will yourself into being a really excellent driver, race car, truck driver, whatever. 
So it isn't as though like, I'm just a great driver. I, I It's the determination that I'm preaching about. It's the blind ambition, the willingness to accept failure, grind it up, swallow it and keep going, not swallow it, throw up and get sick and turn off all your aspirations and ambitions. It's just the opposite. I think I was determined. I, I, I know I was. Uh, I once did a painting. I Next, I'll show it to you. I did it in, God, I think it was 19... Whoa. Nice, but bitter. <clears throat> I think I did it around 1965, and I wasn't even Sylvester Stone, which is my real name, but I was using a Christian name, name called Mike, and it's signed Mike at the bottom of the uh, painting, and what it is, is this road, a single man holding a single suitcase, tattered coat, young, walking into a city in the background, the city is an inferno. That represented the future. You're either going to go in there and succeed, or you're going to burst into flames and become dust. And as I'm going into the city, the road behind me is disintegrating, which represents there's no retreat. If you commit to this, it's do or die. This is a occupational suicide mission, let's say. And you either hit your target or there is no reverse. Like you, you're driving a car, there is no reverse. There's only one way in and it's got to succeed or you crash and burn. So that is the way I felt about it. There was no retreat. There was no option. There was no exit door. So that's why I think a lot of actors... Um, have a very, very difficult time in making it. Not, It's not the talent. There's so many talented people. I could go to a high school play and go, God, there's some really talented people here. It's when you walk off that stage and you walk onto the stage of professionalism, that's where it gets serious. It's one thing to watch a person. Oh, that's a nice show. It's another thing for someone to pay you hard cash and they're going to put you through the ringer to prove that you deserve it. And you have to keep reinforcing yourself nonstop that you're the real deal, that you have something special. I'm not saying that, and I don't believe in it. Some actors are born character actors. That's what they do. They're chameleons. Actors like myself and other individuals, they're types. They're, they make a statement. They walk into a room. You don't have to know anything about them. But you say, oh, that guy looks like that kind of guy. Period. He, he does not look like a librarian. Sylvester walks in the room. Ah, oh, you're not going to ask him to help you with your income tax returns. No. You're going to say, that guy is um, hmm, unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. So I say be a specialist. If there's something, if you have a certain physical attribute, amplify it and ram it home. Aspiration, incubation, verification. Anyway, keep punching. Ciao.